Then without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce Sean Bryant. Most of you already know Sean. He's the executive director and the principal consultant with Yes to ECE, an early childhood training coaching program. Um, he's a nationally recognized professional development facilitator with 29 years of experience, I think probably over 29 years of experience now, expertise and commitment to advancing the work of adults involved with the lives of young children. In addition to his work at Yes to ECE, Sean is a lead coach for the state of Pennsylvania's uh, Pennsylvania Key in support of the Office of Child Development and Early Learning's Early Head Start CCP. He supports coaches throughout the state and as a program administrator with Yale University Center for Child Development and Social Policy. He trains, oh, what a great sound. He trains and facilitates use of the child tool for early childhood mental health consultants across the country. Sean is con contributing editor of forthcoming trauma responsive family engagement and early childhood practices for equity and resilience that's um, to be released the fall of this year, 2021. He has taught preschool, college, provided early childhood mental health consultation, has led a countywide early childhood program, provided training and technical assistance for state universal pre-K programs, and provided training and technical assistance for a state universal pre-K program. Sean, thank you so much, friend. I We can't appreciate you enough. Um, the expertise, uh, not just with the topics, but with your ability to create trainings and learning events that make learning and skill building sticky. So we really impacts the work that we do. We appreciate you very much. Um, and I'll just say, take it away and I'll help monitor the chat for you today. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Um, wow, listening to you uh, talk there was, sometimes when you hear it back, it's like, wait a minute, really? So thank you, Beth, I appreciate that. Beth, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Um, okay, typically it's a green line sure. around it that tells me, but I don't see the green line and I got nervous. So I appreciate it's that. It's right there. So welcome everyone, welcome, good morning, good morning. Happy you're all here. Um, in this short elevation today, we're gonna learn some things, we're gonna practice some things, spend some time processing together with the goal that you'll be able to walk away with a better understanding of friendship formation in the early years, its direct effect on school readiness for young children as a marker for school readiness. Um, and we're gonna talk about that some, but that you'll leave with uh, fundamentally um, a goal for taking back to your work, um, a goal to taking back to your home if you're a parent or if it's your work and your home or wherever it is that you uh, service young children. The goal is that you'll know some things about friendship, how to teach friendship skills, how to promote them and help children engage fundamentally in um, friendship skills. All right, so as Beth said, I'm Sean Bryant. I won't go over this because she gave a, a, a lengthy intro, introduction there, but um, just a little bit about me that's on the screen. I spend my days, my pretty much afternoons, evenings, and uh, more and more weekends, it seems like, um, spending time with you all, those people who care and educate our youngest citizens across this country. And um, I just love the work that, uh, I, I do, Beth, I literally just got invited to Utah. I've driven through Utah once when I was driving across the country from Oakland to uh, Maryland and then from Oakland to St. Louis. Um, I did them both and I, I drove through the Salt Flats, but um, I will be in Salt Lake City, Utah in August with a neighborhood house and I'm really excited about it. So, oh, it's so um, cool. I'm not surprised. I've never worked in Utah before. This is going to be my first time to put that pin on my um, calendar. So i excited to spend some time with them and their professionals and their teachers and what they're doing for uh, the young children and families there. And of course, as Beth said, um, I'm actually transitioning from Teaching Excellence Center to Yes to ECE. So all on social media, everything says Yes to ECE, but we haven't pushed out the new 
um, website yet uh, for some technical reasons that uh, we're working on. But feel free, feel free. I encourage you all to follow me on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook, um, and on YouTube. We're looking at putting more videos there, but definitely, definitely follow me. You know, Sybil follows me. I see Sybil's face there. And she's very active and I appreciate Sybil um, because she's always um, letting me know that she's listening and that uh, she's engaged and it's inspiring to me on the other end. So I encourage you all, you know, even out throughout today, if you, you know, feel need that something resonated with you and you want to go to Instagram or Facebook and post it, I highly encourage you to do that. In this virtual learning process, we're going to talk about friendship formation. We're going to raise awareness about it, learn some new skills, and you're all going to practice. I'm literally um, giving you lots of opportunities to practice more with each other um, instead of packing things in. Uh, so I'm really excited about that because I love hearing from uh, those folk who are on the ground doing that work each and every day. I encourage you to grab something to write with, a pen and paper, um, so that we're not typing, taking notes. But what we find is when we actually move our wrists and our fingers, our muscle memory takes hold and how it goes into our brain actually strengthens our capacity to remember and recall it opposed to typing it. And I know that's hard for some of us because my preference is to type, but um, I actually do know that when I write, it, it lands differently. I just, I'm such a poor writer that um, I oftentimes write things down and can't remember what I wrote 10 minutes later. Um, so if that's you also, I totally understand. Our community agreements today, you know, we want you to share, speak openly, bring your experience, bring your thoughts, your questions um, in your reflective capacity uh, to this, but definitely focus on what it is that you can take back to uh, the space and places that you share with young children and their families. Um, of course, we use the chat box and we allow you to unmute here. You know, I'm on so many Zooms throughout the week and oftentimes I'm on Zooms where there are thousands of people and I had to pay $400 to be there um, and then they won't let you unmute yourself. I can't see who's there and all I'm doing is hearing the presenter, which is fine because I, I can learn that way, but this is not designed to be that way. These are designed to be as interactive as possible, even through the virtual um, technical setting. So we want you to raise your voice up, um, share, stay engaged, maintain a sense of relevancy um, and support the session in terms of the dialogue in the breakout rooms and when we come back to the larger group. All right, so Beth, it looks like we have about 46 people. So our first question of the day, our first question of the day um, is how do you help children become friends? How do you help children become friends? So I want you to take 30 seconds and think about that. How do you help children become friends? So what I just put in the chat box is a link. It's a Padlet link. So what I want you to do is click on that link. It's going to take you to the Padlet. And when you get to the Padlet, you're going to see um, a Padlet with four little boys sitting in the grass. Um, and a big question at the top, how do you help children become friends? At the bottom right, there's a pink circle with a plus. When you decide what it is you want to respond to by answering that question, and we're going to take about, you know, three minutes to let you all do this. Click on that circle, your box will pop up, and then you can start answering the question. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Um, and then once you've written yours, I know some of you are thinking and writing, I see it and I'm sure Beth sees it. I wanna encourage you to go back down the timeline and kind of read some and the ones that resonate with you, you can actually click on those little hearts telling that person that you liked what they typed. Um, and then as more and more of us, cause of over 40, there's 47 people there uh, start to participate. At the end, there's an arrow that will let you move it down to see what everybody else has um, written. So we're gonna take about four to five minutes there, maybe a little bit more Beth, maybe about five or six minutes. 
I see someone said modeling with coworkers and families, mm -hmm. modeling positive social behavior. So I want to encourage us because we do this in early childhood. Um, I'm having these conversations and coaching sessions that when we write those things to think about what it is specifically that we're that we're talking about when we say that. Um, see, one person said in my play group, I help children become friends by introducing families, noticing mm -hmm. what children like encouraging children who enjoy similar materials to play beside or with each other. I sometimes read books on friendships, on friendship and asking them to help each other. See, they're real specific there with exactly what they do. Um, that helps us, that helps uh, those who are reading and it helps us to become clearer about um, what it is that I'm modeling. Is it a specific aspect of social behavior that I'm modeling? or I want my children to learn so that my colleague and I, or my partner and I, who, whatever the other, whoever the other adult is, that you are um, intentionally thinking about what it is that, that you're modeling. So someone says encouraging children to play with each, to play with each other. Um, I help children, kids to talk with each other, play with each other, be curious, curiosity, interesting, asking them to help each other modeling kindness through interaction, modeling friendship behaviors amongst adults and talking to them and children to introduce the concept of welcoming to children. I love that. Um, and model those behaviors for children to observe and uh, learn about. I love that. Who, who, who wrote that one? You should have put your name in there. Uh, encouraging children with the same interest to play together. Uh, Favorite five says, I have them spend time with children and ask them how they feel with them. Um, have them spend time with children and ask them, oh, okay. I help them become friends by encouraging them to talk to each other. I role model, asking them to help each other, modeling through interactions. Sing and dance together. I love that one. Yes. You know, we find humor is actually a, a entry road or pathway into friendships that children who laugh together, the research found, and this is some new stuff that I literally just read last week, um, that when the adults in their lives or the teachers, because they were really looking at preschool age children, um, brought humor into their spaces, the children who shared that, that humor and found it funny or connected with another child who was laughing, they started to play together and interact with each other and like, and what, what other time do we need to, to find things to laugh and be happy about them right now? So um, as a strategy that we can bring into our environments. Awesome. Thank you all for uh, all of these excellent, excellent shares. I'm still trying to find out, Beth, who wrote that one that uh, I really, really liked. I don't know who that was, but I really like that one, Beth. So maybe we can get them to put their name in the chat box. Yeah, it was really great. A very clear um, list of activities and things to do. Yeah, the one who, whoever wrote, um, introduced the concept of welcoming to children. Mm -hmm. If you're brave enough to share with us. Um, who you are. You can put it in the chat box or mute and say, that was mine, Sean. That was mm -hmm. mine. We sure need more of that these days, the idea of teaching about welcoming and. Um, Definitely. Oh, it was Ron said so that was mine, Tony, and it comes from Second Step. Awesome, Ron. Um, so thank you, Ron. Um, yeah, Second Step, it's, I'm always happy, Ron. Second Step costs so much money, each one of those boxes. Um, I'm always happy when people can actually bring the stuff back out and which proves like they actually read the scripts, you know, because it's a scripted uh, inter violence prevention curriculum intervention, Beth, um, that many, many programs utilize across the country. And it's, it's some great stuff there, but for it to work, the adult has to pull the cards out and actually read it. And what we find is that's the part that doesn't happen. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm great that Ron, who's a manager at Head Start up in Contra Costa, um, has definitely read that. So Ron, today you are our first winner. Um, Beth knew that was coming. I could see the look on her face. She knew that was coming of um, an Amazon gift card. So Ron, if you email me, 
um, at Sean at teachingexcellencecenter.com. So my name, S-H-A-W-N, the email address is on every single slide. Um, and then I will email you back um, your uh, E, it'll be an electronic gift card. And I will do it, won't I do it, Sybil? Sybil's won a few times. Sybil's been in Alameda, she's been to Marin, she's been a few places and she's won a few times. So um, I will do it, Ron. We're, we're truthful here. Congratulations again, and thank everyone who decided to um, access the link and put it up there. So let's jump right into some 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 background, just a little background, um, and then we're going to do some more fun stuff. So this notion of how do we promote? Because we start with promoting before we start teaching uh, friendship skills in young children, and what we've actually found is that when we promote friendship skills, it's actually a marker or a benchmark for school readiness, meaning skills and knowledge that we want young children to have upon kindergarten entry, um, friendship formations and knowing how to make friends, knowing how to be friendly at ages four, five, and six are really, really not just important to the preschool child, but they're important uh, in terms of success in kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, because it's a developmental responsibility that stays with us. So what that means is the earlier we teach children how to make friends, how to become friendly, um, how to walk into spaces. And I always say this about my oldest nephew who literally just graduated from high school a month ago, his whole life, he just had the ability when he was four to walk into a space and he would leave and everyone would know him. We went to the beach, all the lifeguards would know him. And it wasn't because they were saying, this little boy is making trouble. It wasn't that at all. It was the other end where they were like, who's that little kid? Um, hey, little guy, what's your name? He's always been that person. So this friend, this notion of walking away with friendship, friendships and knowing new people came easy to him. It came really, really easy to him. Where if you compared him to his brother or his uncle, those things were hard for us. It required more work. It required more what, not just promoting, but more discreet teaching from an adult. And we're gonna talk about some of that as a, a strategy later. So we know that the effects of friendships on school success, it shows up very early, okay? That young children in our care and the kids we educate who know how to form and maintain, that's the other part, close friendships. Cause some of us know even as adults, we keep meeting new people, but they keep dropping by the wayside because it's it requires work and skill sets to maintain friendships, even in adulthood. But here's what we know that about young children, young children who can form and maintain close friendships in early childhood, adjust well to school. Think about that. If I can know the person on my left, I'm saying, hey, Beth, hey, Leah, and then I enjoy sitting by them. It doesn't feel constrained. I'm going to listen more. It all works together. It all works together in this way that says, oh, this is preparation for not just being social, but the social aspects of learning. That's the deeper part there. All right. They do well in class and they have high self-esteem. To me, I was like, okay, this all makes sense upon the research where I was thinking I could have done this research just from my observations in early learning settings, that they all work together in terms of doing well in class, having friends and having a good sense of myself. These are all important social skills, um, just like cooperation and problem solving are. So this notion of friendship skills being something that we might get to or we get to occasionally, when we think of social emotional foundationals, foundations as a domain of learning, just like literacy, mathematics and science are, I firmly believe that this is the one that they all rest on because it becomes hard to do the others well if this one isn't there and friendships help that happen. Um, so it's our role to see who can initiate those friendships, who are the children that are slow to task, who are the children that are really quiet, who are the children that stay to themselves, who are the children that you never see playing with other children. They play and you almost forget they're there and often those are the children who haven't what? Developed or maintained friendships in early learning settings. Those are often the children who get really excited when their families come because they know I'm going home and someone's gonna give me a different kind of attention because the other children there 
um, haven't yet noticed them and they haven't developed what we call play entry skills. And we're gonna talk about play entry skills um, in this session. All right, so this is a little scenario. I'm gonna read the scenario, then I'm gonna put it in the chat box. Um, and this is that time when you all get to talk to each other. So this is the time when I'm gonna ask you all to um, elevate. And what I mean by elevate is, it's really an equitable or an, or an inequitable situation when we come on Zoom. And, um, and I'm not doing this to make people feel bad, but it's the reality. When we come on Zoom and then we go into breakout rooms because adult learning theory says we learn from those experiences deeper than we learn from hearing a song, right? So we're always looking to embed that into the learning experience. But when we go into the room, if Sean, Beth, and Leah are in the room and Beth puts her camera on, Leah doesn't and Sean doesn't, then Beth has no one to look at. And then Beth is talking and she may hear Sean or Leah's voice. It becomes an inequitable situation. So Beth's learning is what it's immediately diminished. So I just wanna encourage you if you can, um, that when you go into the breakout spaces um, to, um, cut your camera on. Leah, if we can put three people in each room, that would be great. Cut your camera on and unmute yourself and really discuss the, uh, the, the scenario. Um, what I find is when that happens, the conversation is elevated uh, to this really great place. And for those who are, um, aren't familiar or struggle, when you get pushed to the breakout room, I just put in the chat box, the scenario again, so when the three of you go there, you won't see the chat. You have to hover at the bottom, but the screen is gonna be black and it's gonna say chat, click on it. And the last thing that just popped up in the chat, it's gonna pop up on the side and you'll be able to reread it. Or if you're more comfortable just taking a picture of the screen with your phone, do what works for you, but it's in the chat. Um, we're hoping to have three people in each uh, breakout room and we're gonna give you time to discuss the scenario with Ms. Donna. Ms. Donna is a preschool educator. She did a home visit and she met Kylie and her family and Kylie was shy and withdrawn. Um, and then Kylie's family said that, you know, they wanted her to engage more in social interactions with peers her age. You know, Ms. Donna is a skilled teacher. Um, so she started planning interesting activities, um, limiting the number of children who can play in the area because we know that those two are strategies if you have an activity that is meaningful to Beth, Beth's gonna to gravitate towards that activity. And if there are less children there, so if there are five children, that means Beth may not talk to any of them. But if there are two or three, then we end up talking to each other because we're playing with the same objects. So those are actually concrete strategies that build friendships, okay? So Ms. Donna knows this, so she sets that up, but she still doesn't feel sure that that's enough for Kylie. And she's a little bit nervous about the beginning of the school year, you know, after the pandemic and meeting, meeting Kylie's needs. So what you're gonna do is lots of experts who do this every day is come up with, based on your experience, how you would support Kylie in the context of developing friendships. What specific experiences would you give her in addition to the interesting activities in limiting, limiting the number of children who play in the area, what else might you offer up to Kylie in terms of friendship formation? You know, Sean, the scenario describes my older daughter very much when she was. Really? Yeah, very much so. Um, and I, I was kind of worried about her um, reservedness and shyness. And um, I remember her teacher saying to me to focus, fo let's focus on her strengths, the things that she does really well, which is she does have good language skills. So for a number of those early years that when she was like five and six um, and even earlier, well, not so much really at six, she took a, she, she came out, but before then like three, four, we would go to classes and I would like this dance class, this Irish dance class that she wanted to take but couldn't participate mm -hmm. and sit with her and she would tell me what to write down <clears throat> and then practice it when we went home. And I started doing that when the teacher told me, you know, you have to allow her to be whoever she is and not 
push her to a point where she feels bad about not being able to participate. And for me as a parent, I needed to hear that. And I needed to rely on her teacher who was doing these incremental things like you've got here to help her grow. And that I was only creating more pressure. So it gave me great appreciation for the skill of teachers in the classroom um, to know how to do that. And then, you know, obviously she, about age six, things kind of turned around for her and she was able to engage more and actually gave a speech in fifth grade to the graduating class. I mean, wow. yeah, so, um, but I totally identify with this little vignette. So I don't know if anybody else, I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Beth. You know, that, that was, it's awesome because it's, it's what actually happens so much yeah. for, um, for folk around parents, around teachers having this information and then having some distance. You know, I love that Lily and Kat, you know, that, she, I don't know why we, we should have this on every bumper sticker everywhere. She said, you know, there are seven distinctions between being the parent and being the teacher and that we forget that Beth's view is of her child. The teacher's view is of all 20 children. Yeah. And we, we can expect Beth to see all 20 children in that light. Um, and we can't expect the teacher to only see that one child. The teacher seeing that child in the con context of all the children but being able to see what their individual needs are. Right. And what we find is when you do that, it makes it a little bit easier to hold it because I'm not just thinking of just the one child, I'm thinking of all 20 and, mm -hmm. and I know their individual needs and it makes it a little bit easier mm -hmm. to hold it. And teachers have that thing that it just takes parents a little while longer. Yeah. Uh, and I think parents forget what an asset it is to have someone have a professional involved in their child's life on a daily basis and that they can use that professional in ways to help them in their home with sure. it as well. I, I don't know. All right, awesome, welcome back, welcome back. So um, I think this would be a great time to, uh, for those who want to, uh, Ms. Donna and Kylie and uh, what you and maybe whatever you and your group discussed, if you can succinctly uh, share it with us around what other supports, teaching strategies would um, you offer up uh, to Ms. Donna or if you were in Ms. Donna's situation at the beginning of uh, the start of school to support uh, young, young Kylie? So it looks like, so. Nadia, did you unmute yourself to speak or was that um, not intentional? No, so Maria, um, when you're in the breakout room, it doesn't record this way. And when Leah posted what you, what, what you all were talking about in the breakout room, we don't get that at all. We only get the people who stayed in the main room, but Leah removes all of that from the recording. Um, but we are recording right now. So my voice and my picture on the screen is being recorded. But when you're in the breakout room, there's no way to record all those breakout rooms. So, um, but if you stay in the main room, what's, what's in the main room is recorded. Or if you put it in the chat, that's recorded. But Leah takes all of that out before she posts it on the, the YouTube page. So you're fine, Maria. Yeah, we wanna make sure everyone feels confident when they go into a breakout room. We do not record those. Does anyone want to unmute themselves and share um, what, what your group talked about? I see there's some people who are posting it in the chat. Ricky Hanna says, pairing child with another child that is a social butterfly. Um, Carol Jen said, do the, oh, do the survey to find Kylie's preference. Okay, definitely. Like doing an assessment, that's good. So Carol Jen and then Sybil Moore both unmuted themselves. So Carol, you go first and then Sybil, you'll be second. Thank you both. Okay, hello everyone. Yeah, our group has a group discussion. We, <laughs> yeah, we even you know introduce introduce ourselves each other, and then we figure out that even for the little one, Kelly, Kelly, then yeah, like uh, Miss Donna can do a, a survey and to begin the classroom, so she can know about Kelly's uh, the interesting preference. 
So they will be fit her needs if she has a, a more interesting a preference, they meet their needs so she can be, feel more comfortable, comfortable in the uh, activity. And also our another, uh, she mentioned about modeling and uh, respecting the behavior. So that shows Kelly how to interact with other kids. And I think that is a bit, uh, especially when we back to the school in person, sometimes mm -hmm. kids, they do feel um, a little intimidated before, even they know their, their friends before, but they still feel like a little intimidated in the beginning back to school. So mm -hmm. it's a really good way to warm up like icebreaker or something to help kids to, you know, get engaged in the classroom. So this is our sharing. Thank you, Carol. Excellent. Okay. Appreciate that. Sybil? Okay. Um, can you hear me all right? We can hear you perfect. Perfect. Okay. So I was in room 10 with Maria and we were both discussing different ways that we would interview mom a little bit more during the home visit to mm -hmm. see what Kylie's interests are and to see how social mom is and the other adults that are in charge of raising her and mm -hmm. see how much exposure Kylie has to other groups of kids. Does mom take her to the park? Does she have a church group where she interacts with other children? Things mm -hmm. of that nature. So we had a little bit more background information. And Maria and I also discussed that we would, um, first of all, create a relationship from teacher to child. So Kylie and I would, you know, are we interested in dinosaurs together? So I would verbalize that we're friends. So we're friends. We really enjoy playing dinosaurs and we would play together. If another child wanted to come, I would ask and verbalize, oh, look at Johnny wants to be our friend. Can he join us and be our friend today? And mm -hmm. really do a lot of modeling and verbal intentional teaching at that level to see if she can start feeling more comfortable. I love that, Sybil. Um, and I, I appreciate what you and Carol both added around, Carol, Carol mentioned something in particular around in the chat before she came on, this notion of finding out uh, who the child is, because we're gonna use our observations but before that child came to me, that child spent what the first three or four years with their family. So finding out from them, taking the time, being intentional to find out from them who that child is, what that child's interests are, what are the things that kind of can, you know, tick that child off, what are some of their dislikes um, in, in addition to their likes and who they've been at home, even though we know that in group care, those pieces often have to shift or change but it's some benefit to knowing, you know what? Sean loves Legos. Sean loves to play in the dirt and make mud pies. He has a bunch of Frisbees, but he never tosses the Frisbees. He cuts the water on and he digs in the dirt and then he makes mud pies in his Frisbees and says that they're birthday cakes. This is literally what I used to do. I used to love Legos and my mother would say, I'm stepping on these things again. So that was always the problem because they were everywhere in her house and in my grandmother's house. Um, I used to play in my grandmother's garden and make mud pies. So knowing those things about me would help me what to feel welcomed and enter into friendships with other children who enjoyed those things that the adult knew about. So that's really, really important. And we can learn those things through obs observing children. But when those children show up, if we've already, and the benefit is Ms. Donna did a, what, a home visit. So you really want to see who I am? Come see me in the context of conditions through which I live. Um, you really get to get to know me um, to figure out what's happening around me and to learn some things. Um, I say, you know, those of us who teach and educate, home visits should be a part of every single grade um, until you graduate from high school. You should be, we should all have to do them because if you can get into a child's space and literally not to judge, but to see, oh, okay, now so much makes sense. And the story I often tell, I think Beth has heard the story before, um, Years ago, I was a mental health consultant in San Francisco providing consultation to Wu Yi Children's Services, and they had a site down in Visitation Valley. So those who are familiar with San Francisco, you know, Viz Valley is right at the Daly City line, like literally in Daly City. Uh, and it was this little boy who would step on the tables every single day and jump from the table to the floor, and he would smile and laugh. And the teacher at the time was like, did you see this? He won't stop. It really bothered her because they kept trying to get him to stop. And, you know, I was like, well, 
I'm going to ask the mom if I can come to his house to talk to them. Because that's what I knew to do. It was part of like how I get to know families, not standing in the hallway, but coming to talk to you about your child. And when I opened the door to their apartment, their sofa and the table set flush like this. And what he would do was step up on the chair, walk on the table and flip on the sofa and they would clap and smile. So it was one of those things where I walked in and I was like, in my head, I, I wanted to say, well, I can leave now. Like, I don't even need to be here. Like, I know what to tell them back at school. But of course I couldn't do that. But it was like, they just literally told me when I opened the door, why he's doing that because he's new to Head Start, but he had spent what? His first three and a half years with people clapping when he jumped on the table and rolled on the sofa. And like, is this feet like, yay. So he was doing the same thing at school, what? Expecting the same results when he wasn't getting the same results. And had I not did that home visit, they were seeing it as a challenging problem behavior. You know what I mean? Without having that background information. So that becomes really, really important as an entry point in addition to our observations. So before I move forward, before I forget, because uh, I, I will forget, I put four handouts in the chat for those who are on computers. If you're on the cell phone, you probably won't be able to get them. So you'll have to wait until Leah sends her email to everyone. Um, and then she'll give you the link to the four handouts. So the first handout is literally just a copy of a slide deck. So everything you're seeing. Um, then there's another handout that's called Getting to Know, and it's really one that I designed around how we can get to know children by engaging with their parents before they even show up. So this would be something I would use in a home visit, or if I didn't do the home visit, something I would put in the um, enrollment packet, just a way to get information from the parent that's not always me talking to them, but them having the opportunity to sit and think about what it is that my child likes, like how, do, how does my child sleep? All of the idiosyncrasies about me that aren't just about me, but that can tell a story around what? Friendship formation. Because you're really going to get from my parent. Sean has four cousins that are all his age and they play together all the time. Or you're going to get, Sean's the only child on both sides of his family. When his maternal side and his paternal side, he's the only child. His cousins are all older teenagers and he's four. That's very, very telling for a family to tell you that that Sean actually plays with other children his age because his aunts and uncles all have children compared to the other cousins are all much older than he is, or there are no cousins. He spends all his time with adults, which is my godson who's now nine, but when he was two, three, and four, he only wanted to play with adults. He did not want to play with other children because that's not who he would spend his time with. So we always had to literally be there as a part of the strategy to engage him to play with other children. If he walked in the room and there were five children here and two adults here, he would walk to the two adults and start talking to them, literally, and ignore the children because he was always around, what, three adults, his mother, his father, and me for the most part. Um, and when I recognized that, part of the strategy was we've got to get him into other social situations around um, other other children. Um, and the other strategy was he was in a family child care home. And, you know, we took him out of the family child care home and put him in a center-based space. Um, that was a little bit overwhelming for him, uh, but there were more children to what, for him to pick from. And you know what he had the second week there? He found a buddy. The second week there, he found a buddy. Um, so that was part of the rationale. So we've got to figure out what's working, what's not working, and then create a plan of action um definitely a plan of action so thank you uh carol thank you sybil does anyone else has anything they want to share let's see i see some stuff here in the chat beth um huh? Inye says also observing her at place and she has language you could help give her leads to her, her interests namaya says um, i enjoy home visits to early head start and started to do it with ousd as well it is an amazing experience that is so true that is so true namaya it is an amazing experience Venus says having a paired activity can do with another child, like playing, building a nature walk or a book, definitely. We've got to find out their interests though, find out their high interests. Not the thing I played with today and maybe never played with again, but the thing I gravitate towards every day. That's the difference between an interest and a high interest. 
in, in terms of friendship formation, it's high interest items that we want to go uh, go after. Can you all still see my screen, Beth? Okay, something just jumped on my screen. I was like, did I click off or something? So thank you, thank you all. So Sybil and Carol, you are our winners of the day. Sybil, you know what to do, so I won't explain it to you. Carol, my email, sean at teachingaccentcenter.com, and I will um, email you um, some, sometime tonight, not right after. Usually right after, I go get a glass of wine and I take an old man nap. So not right after, but later tonight um, when I wake up from a nap. All right. Thank you all for that. Let's jump right in. So when do friendship skills develop? So this little chart, because our minds like order, and I just always throw a chart in there just because. Um, and for those who are on small devices, you probably can't see this. But on the far left column, there is an age column. So it's from birth to 12 months, 12 months to 18 months, 18 to 23, 24 to 36, 36 to 48, and 48 to 60 months. Um, and then there are three columns, relationships with adults that children have, relationships with their peers that are what we're gonna focus on, and then social emotional skills. And I really just want you to pay attention to the whole chart, but this notion of relationships with skills. And as you see from infancy up into preschool, what begins to happen. Um, and if you pay attention visually to the, the chart, you'll see that infants and toddlers, what there are lots of things around relationships with adults that are indicative of friendship skills. And then that begins to transition. And when you look at relationships with peers, it becomes empty. And then you see more check marks under what toddlers and preschoolers. Um, and that's that developmental piece. And then when you look at the social emotional skills, it really becomes apparent in terms of the older preschools because a hallmark of preschool education um, that we've kind of gotten away from, but it's still there, is friendship formation. That a hallmark of what preschool provide, provided and still should provide is that children become social in the context of uh, peers their own age. And that in those daily relationships, they're working out social situations. So we anticipate that everything is gonna be perfect, that they're gonna to have to learn how to problem solve, do some conflict resolution, do some delay and gratification, do some waiting. And that some of the children show up like Beth and she's okay with waiting. And other children show up like Sean and he's never had to wait before. He literally hasn't had to wait. So he takes it from Beth and it doesn't mean he's evil or he's bad. He needs what? Me to teach him the expected behavior around that. So that then what? Beth wants to play with him. Because if he continues to do that, Beth won't want to play with him. So you can just use this chart as a guide when you go back to your, your classroom, your work, or your, um, your home. Any questions before I move forward? Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Carol, you're going to email me. So you're going to email me, Carol. And then when you email me, I will email you back the um, e-gift card. No worries. That that happens. So Carol, I used to do that. I used to email people. Then it became too hard. It was a whole like part-time job. And I'm like, I'm running people down to give them my money. So my therapist was like, you need to stop that. You need to stop that. So I, I'm listening to my therapist. My therapist is um, real good. We have awesome Zoom sessions. So promoting friendship skills, these are early on. These are the things we do with very young children, you know, typically under three. Um, when we're with toddlers, during those routines that we're going through them, because we know in the infant and toddler years, they're rich in routines, like we're transitioning, we're having meals together, you know, we usually change diapers, we sing songs together, those routines, we're going outside together. That's when we can ask them to help each other. That's when you can say, you know, Sybil and Ricky, could you hold hands while we walk through the door and I'll hold the door for you? You know what? Oh, Leah and Carol, could you help each other carry that pail over here so that we can all dig in the sand? These simple tasks, and you know with toddlers, they don't have a lot of expressive language for the most part, but they understand what you say. So they'll look at you, go get the pail and bring the pail to you. So we're actually encouraging those friendship skills when they do it together, because what you'll find is when we repeat that, they'll start doing it without you. They'll start doing it without you, all right? Then we wanna, of course, maintain a level of positivity at work, 
but using our words and our language to support children in playing with each other. And these are things that I'm sure for most of you aren't brand new, but these are actually the research-based strategies that work, but they only work if we're persistent, meaning we do it ongoing and continuously. So we define in the research persistent as existing for no less than a month. So that means typically in preschools, we're in school at least 21 days out of the month. So for something to become persistent, meaning the challenging behavior or positive behavior, meaning that's a behavior that isn't gonna go away unless we do some, something different. If we do that every day, we help that positive behavior become a persistent and desirable behavior. That's on the short end. That's every single day we're embedding into our lesson plan, into our curriculum, the beginning parts of friendship formation for toddlers and for children who are new to preschool, all right? Then of course we wanna use our handy dandy literacy items, but that means we've got to take time and find the right books because just because the book says friends, doesn't mean it's the right book for your children or it's the right book for you to read. And I know it seems like for some of you who are skilled educators, before you purchase or bring the book into your classroom, make sure you read it first. I'll say it again, before you purchase or bring it into your classroom or even get it from the library, read it first. I can't tell you the number of books, the title and the pictures look nice. And I started reading the book and I had to do a couple of things. I either skip the pages or I end up removing the page altogether. And these are some current books that are children's books that are recently published and I'm reading them. And many of them are socially emotional based and what they're asking children to do, I'm like, oh, this is so inappropriate. This is not age appropriate, or this is just incorrect. And I'm like, everybody loves this book. And then, you know, as I read it, I'm like, I would not bring this into my classroom. So as you see those books and those titles, um, make sure that it's appropriate for you, your population, and that it's meeting your friendship need. Um, and one of the handouts gives you um, a few books on um, friendships. All right. We have a we have a recording of a training we did on children's books that uh, are good and helpful. So you can check that out on our YouTube channel. I'll put it in the. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, from Tandem. Tandem came, right? It no, not... another woman who came whose name I can't remember. Sharon, I think was her name. Anyway, I'll put a link to our videos in the chat. Okay. And the, the other two pieces around just practicing opportunities. We're really talking about practicing helping each other, playing together in the beginning pieces of turn-taking. So turn-taking, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the three tiers. In the beginning, it requires an adult. Children will not participate in turn-taking unless we're a part of it. So if you ask them to do it in the, the, themselves and walk away, 90% of the time it won't happen um, because we're promoting it, meaning we're a part of it, okay? Um, and then we promote friendship skills. And these are all things that you're all familiar with. So giving suggestions, we give suggestions to help organize the play, okay? This notion of sharing toys and materials, that's that turn-taking and reciprocity. I have the ball, I roll it to Beth. The expectation is she rolls it back to me. That's turn-taking, that's not sharing, okay? Sharing is I have the ball. Beth, Beth says, I would love the red ball, Sean. I want the red ball and I'm not attached to it that way. And I may say, oh, you can have it. I've shared the ball with her. And we oftentimes think turn-taking and sharing are the same and they are not um, the same. So really, really know that, that those are the fundamental differences. Um, it's helpful, meaning that my friendship and peer in early childhood becomes an assist for me. That person can assist me in doing things that I don't know how to do, okay? Oftentimes on the other side, these are pieces where the adult comes in. We actually show this level of affection to children who are friendship, developing friendships, and then they start showing that affection to each other around saying, hey Beth, do you wanna come play with me? And I reach out my hand without saying hold my hand, but that kind of affection that you'll see beginning to blossom in early childhood. And we need to watch for those because they're telltale signs of the beginning signs of friendships. Um, children who are beginning to show signs of being friendships in the beginning, they start to compliment each other um, on how they play, wanting to be with them. It's, and it doesn't become superficial that I like your shirt. 
I like your pants. I like that you're wearing the color blue. It's much deeper than that for um, young young children. Then this this then I'm I'm gonna skip the empty one. This notion of responding and maintaining, you'll see that they begin to respond to each other's play. So let's say Beth's in the block area and she's building. I'm watching Beth, but I don't have a lot of friends. Here's what a teacher can do. So the teacher can come over and see, oh, Beth's building. What are you building, Beth? And she says, oh, I'm building a skyscraper. Beth's building a skyscraper, Sean. Oh, I see Beth is using the unit blocks. Those are all the unit blocks because you know all the blocks have names, right? That's a whole nother training. Um, they're all just not blocks. They all actually have discrete names. Uh, I remember, bless her heart, Blanca, she works in Marin. And when I was coaching her one year, uh, and she was so taken aback when I brought that up. She was like, I've been doing this and I never really realized that all have different names. So she made it her business. She was like, I want this to be my coaching goal that I would be the, I want to learn all the names of the blocks. And I was like, well, you can do that, but that shouldn't be the goal. Like your goal needs to be engaging with them around sophisticated block building. Uh oh, that's my phone in the background, Beth. Beth's going to get me after this. Um, I don't want to get up because it's way on the other side of the room. I'm so, so sorry. But she realized that, oh, these blocks have names and I can learn them and use them when I'm with children. And here's how friendship develops. Beth is building with the blocks. Sean is watching. So then Beth says, Sean, go pick up a unit block. And I pick up the unit, not the teacher says, Sean, go pick up a unit block. And then Beth says, can I have that? Because I have what, what she needs. I'm not interrupting. I'm not really talking because I don't have play entry skills yet and I hand her the block. And then the teacher says, get another one. And I get another one and Beth says, can I have that? So she's addressing me now and I hand it to her. So then I, I pick up on what's happening. You know what I do? I go get a bunch of blocks and I stand there like, Beth is gonna ask me for another one. So us, it seems mundane and foolish, but this is how friendship develops in early childhood. It happens just like that with a skilled teacher who's watchful, who's observing, and who's maintaining that that's part of our role to help that develop and grow, all right? Um, so I'm gonna come back to this one now around empathy because this is really, really, really uh, important around us checking in with children around what they understand that's happening when they're with their friends um, and maintaining this sense of we're communicating with parents because that's where this, this kind of empathetic sense comes in, that at home parents are modeling cooperation and kindness, that children see them talking to their neighbors, the shopkeeper, when they're at the store, the grocery store clerk, they see them smiling, saying goodbye and hello. Those greetings are really these pieces of how children start to develop. You know, they say, oh, we're gonna have uh, Miss Sue and Mr. John and Alexa and, um, Maria come over and we're all going to have dinner. And we're telling our children that, and they're gonna bring our, our, their kids over. We're gonna host them for dinner. All of these are ways that friendships begin to develop for young children because they're watching and they're learning and pulling from all of those experiences. Um, so it's our role and responsibility to help families understand that when they do those things, they're helping their child or not helping their child, depending on what they're saying about the person when they leave Trader Joe's, the conversation in the car, because they could actually be helping their child not to what become friendly based on what they're saying around people when they're in places. So it can work against us. So here's a big one too, um, in my, my last kind of chat before you all talk, this notion of children with disabilities. So what we know is that children with disabilities oftentimes as a result of their limited opportunities, um, they don't spend time with their more competent peers and many, many children with disabilities have this kind of developing gap where we want the gap to begin to close in preschool as an early intervention, because preschool is still an early intervention in this, in this country, for those who don't know it, um, that the gap starts to widen for children when they get to preschool because of the social isolation um, and their, their ability to not be welcomed in to start to have friendships that are maintained so in our inclusive environments, and anytime you hear me use the word inclusive, I'm talking about action. So one cannot be inclusive without some action attached to it. They are synonymous as how I define them. 
Because I think too often we see inclusion as this thing we check off, but it's this ongoing action that happens around it. So if this environment is inclusive, then as the teacher, we need to step back and observe also and say, oh, I'm seeing Hector. Everybody's walking past him, but he's right there. No one's asking them. And I'm going to create an intentional plan to get them to notice Hector as part of what their social community so that he's not left out. And oftentimes, you know what has to happen? I'm going to go over to the science area where they're weighing things that are heavy and light. I'm going to go over to the water table and bring Hector with me and start engaging and be what the buffer for Hector. And we're going to talk about what that looks like in terms of priming and play entry skills that requires an adult to discreetly teach those. But really consider your children with, with diagnosed and some children who you suspect that may not have a diagnosis in needing our real support around developing friendship skills so that we don't in, you know, implicitly render them invisible in our early learning spaces. Because that's essentially what happens, that we're making sure that they're a crucial part of the classroom and they're not missed the way other children um, are, are not missed um, simply because um, they may have a diagnosed or undiagnosed uh, disability or possibly even a delay that is, is severe enough where they can't articulate the way their peers are articulating. So they get left out of what? The play interaction, specifically for older preschoolers who the play interaction turns into what? A lot of language exchanging. So in those situations where they're talking to each other a lot, uh, those children with language delays can easily get left out of those situations. So Nadia says, we will have to prepare our group of children about our new friend in this way, she will be part of the group. Well, I think definitely depending on, you know, uh, their disability, if their family's uh, okay with that kind of spotlight, because um, children know, I think it's our role to actually make sure that they're just being included, but whatever way works for you and your community of learners and their families, I say definitely go with it with the intent that we're not going to um, leave children out because th that's the big piece that we're noticing and observing each and every day that children, specifically our children with disabilities are included in the play at arrival, they're inclu included at table conversation, they're included in free choice, they're included in small group, they're included in large group, you know, they're participating with their, their peers outside that throughout the day, um, they're included. And that could just be developing a peer buddy system in your, in your classroom where children are assigned to peer buddies. And the peer buddy is basically one child has the core strength and one child doesn't. So Beth has this core strength where she's really friendly. She's really externalized. Everybody in the classroom goes home and they say, you know, Beth today said this, Beth today did, did that. There are preschoolers who do that. And every child in the classroom knows them. And then all the families show up and say, who's Beth? Everybody wants to see Beth, like, because everybody's child is coming home talking about Beth. And then Sean, who doesn't do that at all, um, a parent will say, well, no one's playing with that little boy right there. And then the child says, I don't know who he is. So the teachers have to be aware of that so that we don't cause that chasm in terms of children who have the skills and children who don't. And at the same time, recognizing that pairing me with Beth may not work for Beth and it may not work for me because I may not have enough skill. If Beth is so far advanced, I may be so far advanced that it's frustrating for her because I can't keep up. So I need someone with more skills than me, but not so far beyond that it's gonna feel like a burden for them to support me. So recognizing that shift also when we're creating peer buddies as a strategy. All right, so now I'm gonna stop and you all are going to um, do some chatting with each other. So this is going to require you to think, to think about what have you noticed during your time um, teaching or parenting young children about breakdowns in child friendships? What have you noticed? You're going to go to breakout rooms. What have you noticed that causes or about breakdowns in the friendships of young children? All right. What have you noticed? So Leah, let's send, th let's send them in the, um, the breakout room space. And because they've already introduced themselves and you know, talked about their favorite ice cream and where they work at um, and, you know, their COVID situation at their place of work. They probably only need six minutes this time, Leah, three people. 
So let's send them um, now. Thank you, Leah. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Um, that breakout wasn't as long as the other ones. And thank you all, because for um, I could see so many people went into the breakout rooms and cut your cameras on. So I'm very appreciative of that, um, of you, you sharing in, in that space uh, with the folk in the room with you. So what did you notice about the breakdown? And what do you notice about the breakdown in child friendships? What do, what do you notice? You can share in the chat. You can unmute yourself um, and come on the airway. So I see Simone. Oh, yes. Give me, I can show my face too. How it's, are you? I'm good, Simone. Thank you. And uh, one of the things we noticed, because we were in the classroom and then it came up at the last minute, sometimes it's outside of the classroom. Sometimes it's the parent or the caregivers that um, may start, may say something, oh, well, you know, that child, um, you know, that child's a baby or that child still sucks his thumb and that child always cries and that kid takes that back in the classroom. And when that kid is in the classroom, that kid kind of shies away from that kid, even though that kid may like that kid. That's true. I've, unfortunately, I've heard that a variety of times um, with parents saying things to children outside of the classroom, outside getting in the car, or even a few times in the classroom mm -hmm. in front of the other child. So that definitely, I think, is a, um, a huge rupture in the developing or budding friendship. Thank you for that, Simone. Thayon? Okay. Um, we, we talked about um, what Simone mentioned also, the parents, how the parents influence um, children on who they should be friends with or not. But then we also talked about the um, children's individual social skills mm. and um, their home environment and culture, their individual cultures and styles that can play a part in how they, um, you know, make friends and how they interact socially with other kids. Mm -hmm. That's true too, Fayon. In my um, uh, when I'm when I'm doing like. ABAR trainings, anti-bias, anti-racist trainings, I have this clip that I found. Um, it's a much longer clip. It's really talking about like uh, suspension and expulsion of black boys, but there's this one moment where they go back in time, a little boy is young and his parents bring him to the sand box. And there's another family there of a different race. And the two kids, when they play with each other, the other child's parent kind of says, come on, we're leaving. Um, and that's kind of what that, that thing that I heard you say around, like children are learning from that where they showed up and wanted to play with each other. And one of the parents was like, nope, like with no words, just like we're leaving abruptly. Um, they all experience it. So that definitely could uh, stop a friendship from developing. And the unfortunate part is oftentimes children don't know why. That's the real hurtful part that that they don't know why, other than what was modeled for them. Thank you, Theon. Namaya, I see your hand is raised. So we also touched on um, the parent in action, but then we also touched on um, the child's birthing, um, the birthing stage. So like the, the only child, how their interaction is at home being the only child. So if you're the only child, you're always, uh, when, I'm just going to use the word appease. So mom's like, okay, so you don't have to share because you're the only child at home. Then when you're coming into the school setting, you're surrounded by all these children and you don't know how to share because you're the only child. Or being a child um, of older siblings. And you know, like the easy, the easiest way to, um, the easiest way to appease that child is just let her have it. And so the child doesn't know how to how to wait, how to be patient, how to share because they're always getting what they want. And so like when you have friends who do that, a lot of the friends kind of like turn away because it's like, I'm gonna have to give this up or I don't, I don't want to give this up, but I'm gonna have to give this up. So a lot of the friendships kind of uh, kind of move around that way. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're, I, let me rephrase what I think you heard you say. So depending on the child's birthing order, oldest mm -hmm. child, middle child, baby, um, their parents are differently. I think there's some truth to that, but it's not a hard science. Uh, <laughs> and that when they're developing friendships, they want things from their friends. And if the friends say no, then they actually become a little bit of like, well, I'm not going to play with you if you don't give me what I want. 
Um, yes. That will definitely rupture a friendship. Oh, you reminded me of Jasper when I was teaching at Mia House in Berkeley. That was him every single day, every single day. Thank you, Namaya. Kiona, I see your hand up. And Kiona, before you speak, I just want to honor Ron. I, I, I love the comment that you put in the chat. We talked about children getting older, such as pre-K. They might have an argument with another child and say to the teacher, she won't be my friend. And I, Ron, thank you for bringing that up. So here's the thing about friendship. There's lots of talk in equity circles and social justice circles that as teachers and as adults, we should not tell children that they're our friends. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not telling you I have a decision on that. I'm just letting you know that you may hear more people beginning to talk about this because it's come up in many spaces online that when we say, well, all my friends, that they're not your friends because you don't go out after work and go get pizza and a beer with them, that we should be using different language. So we start there. The other piece though that is more important to me, because um, I feel like there are better conversations that we can be having, whether or not an adult says to children, friends, like, I, I feel like there's so many other things that we can focus on, like compensation. Can we align around that? Um, instead of the detractors, I, I feel like they're detractors. But this notion of she won't play with me when she won't be my friend, or he won't play with me, he won't be my friend. Um, this is really that anti-bias education and curriculum coming up, that when children are talking about that, that we've got to let them know that, first of all, everyone won't be your friend, and that's okay. And that today, Beth is saying, I don't wanna play with you, Sean, and I'm not your friend right now. Because remember, they have a rudimentary version of it, but tomorrow or either later on, because right now Beth is concerned with playing with Leah and she doesn't want to play with me. It's just them two playing. So if I internalize it as she's not my friend, I have to develop that capacity because then in two hours, she's playing with me. And what children do is say, we're friends again. We never were friends. They need a lot of experience and explanation around that, that she's not playing with you right now. She's playing with Leah. And she said she wanted to play later. They need us to help them make sense of that so that they don't see it as, oh, she's not playing with me. She won't be my friend. Um, and then that becomes their narrative. They, they need a lot of support around that because oftentimes, um, what, and I've been guilty of it too, we don't give them enough resourcing around the explaining in a concrete way what's happening and this notion of what a friendship is that it's not, Every day, all day, Beth has to hold my hand and be with Sean to be Sean's friend. Um, and if we don't intervene, that's what Sean begins to believe. So when Beth doesn't show up that way, I end up saying, what? Beth is not my friend. She's being mean. And she's not. She actually articulated, I want to play with Leah right now. It's only two of us playing this game. Um, and they need us to help fill that gap. They need us to help. Fill that, fill it's that like gap. a coaching, isn't it? Definitely, Beth. Definitely. Kiona, thank you for being so patient. You put your hand up and um, I asked you to wait. So go ahead. No problem. I was just going to say COVID was a good breakdown for friendships for children too, just the pandemic we're in. That is so, that was a breakdown for friendships. Um, my friend Carl, who literally just called me the other day, um, we used to go to din dinner, breakfast every Sunday. We would meet. Um, some days it was hard for me because he wanted to have breakfast at like eight in the morning. And I'd be like, oh, I just want to sleep until 11 o'clock. Um, and he called me, you know, he's in California, I'm in Philadelphia. And he was just like, you know, I'm going to take a trip. And he's going to visit his from family in Connecticut. And he was like, I'm coming down to Philadelphia and we're going to have Sunday breakfast. And I was like, great, great, great. But in the back of my head, I was like, not at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, but that, that notion of how COVID has changed um, lots and lots of friendships. Um, and that if they're not maintained in some kind of way, they do wither and kind of uh, fall, fall apart. So thank you for that, that gentle um, reminder. Yeah, there's some other comments in the chat too about parents being role models and um, helping children problem solve and dealing with these feelings. Um, so yeah, sounds like some common conversations are happening too. Um, preparing children for the child that says no, I don't want to. Definitely. It's really, really important. Thank you. Thank you. That was, those are some great shares. You can keep them coming because when you all put it in the chat box and when you unmute yourself, it's hard to really believe it, but 
you really uh, change what everyone else is learning is because people are hearing ideas that they never heard before. They're experiencing your words and it's making them either reflect and think about it. So all of that sharing is, is resourcing and strategy. Um, even if you think people know this already, um, something that I had to contend with as a professional development facilitator, sometimes I would be saying, oh, I'm doing this again, I'm doing this again. And it was literally a teacher who kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, where I work, we have five new teachers who've never taught an early childhood before. They all need to hear what you're saying. And it was like this friendly reminder for me to like get a grip, dude. Like, cause I was like, oh, I'm still doing the entry level stuff for folk. Can we tear it up? Can we go deeper? Yes, we can. But simultaneously, there are always new people coming in too. So for those of us who've been in this work a long time, when we think, oh, the folk here already know that, there are probably 10 or 12 people on this call who don't know it because they haven't been in doing the work and in the field as long. So um, it's this both and, which is why I really try to emphasize the sharing and giving you a voice to share out and to, to encourage you to write in, in the chat when, when possible. So, all right, where are we, Beth? So it was Simone and Theon who are our two winners. Great, great feedback from everybody though. Um, but I, I still got to pay my car insurance. So I can't give everything away that Beth's gifted me for showing up today. Um, so Theon and Sybil, not Sybil, Simone. I'm trying to give Simone stuff to Sybil. Look at that. <laughs> Email me, Sean at teachingexcellencecenter.com. There you go, Beth. She's such a wonder. Um, and I will get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this notion of friendship breakdowns. Here's the how, here are the things to actually watch for. That friendship relationship, specifically in the preschool years, here's the two big pieces to identify if it's a friendship. It needs to be reciprocal. It needs to be reciprocal. If it is, you know, Ron saying, Beth, play with Sean, that may not be reciprocal. He's asking a request of me that I might comply with and I might not. That doesn't mean we get to say, Beth and Sean play together, they're friends. Beth, I'm watching Beth and Sean seek each other out repeatedly in this reciprocal that Sean looks for Beth, Beth looks for Sean. I see this, I notice it. I will see them playing together in positive ways and that is voluntary because the friendship provides benefits to both of them. And the benefits, the foundation of those benefits to Beth and Sean are SEL, social emotional learning that have a direct impact on what Beth and Sean's academic success, okay? So the why is from arrival until departure, we're embedding opportunities for Beth and Sean to have a voluntary reciprocal developing relationship that we label as a friendship. That means they're doing things together, they're playing together, they're reading stories together, they're talking about what they did over the weekend, they're listening. Beth is saying, I went to the beach. And Sean says, we went to the beach, we went to visit my grandma, but we didn't go last week. Last week, we went over to my Aunt Helen's house that you, you hear and you see this back and forth that preschool children will do. Those are the children who are friends. When the child that walks up and starts talking and the kids kind of just look at them and don't respond, that's not reciprocal. What they're saying is we're not sure you're in that piece with us yet. Not necessarily a click, but we need to make sure we have same interests and that we're gonna enjoy being around each other, which is the other part. They enjoy being around each other. So the other how is it's our responsibility to help them form and maintain those friendships. We've got to teach, we have to use the materials, we have to use that second step, we have to use our, our uh, other pieces in the classroom like puppets and books. And then we need to learn from and with families and not always begin to blame families. And for me, that was a huge piece of shifting as a professional from blaming families and saying, you know, he should have done this or she should have did that if they do this and really deciding that I was no longer gonna hold that space in my mind and in my thoughts around families that I was gonna partner with them um, around their concerns and their wishes um, that may be the same as mine as their teacher and they may be completely different um, around friendship skills. Cause they may say, I want my child to have friends. I've heard parents say this because Sean's birthday is coming up and I went to invite the kids to his party. And he said that none of the kids are his friends. Can you help make them become his friend? I've had parents say this in desperation to the teacher, and then the teacher misses the underpinning of the parent leaves and they say, 
she's worried about a daggone party so she can buy a cake and she wants people to come and they're missing the other element. The parent's really saying, I am concerned that my child is lonely. I need you to help my child and they're here with you because when he's, Sean's not here, he's not around other four-year-olds, begin to make friends and then we're gonna have them come to his party in celebration so they can all get to know him better. That's the request, but it oftentimes doesn't get articulated that way. And this is what I mean by learning from it with families to actually hear the meat of what the request is, which is never on the surface of oftentimes how it's articulated. Um, and I just need us to hold that in, in, in a different kind of way around honoring what, what, what parents and families bring. So Ron said, or if a child isn't invited to the party and others in the classroom are, and they believe they aren't that child's friend. Ron, that one right there, I'm let me look at the time. So this was a growth spurt for me, Ron. You know, I'd already been teaching for 17 years in early childhood when I decided I'm going to go get this Montessori credential. Because at the time I thought, oh, I want to open a Montessori because I thought I was going to like live in Oakland for the rest of my life and just die there on the streets of Oakland at like 95 years old. I, I, I thought that was going to be me, you know, with a glass of red wine in my this hand and a piece of cheesy bread in that hand at like 95. Um, but, you know, universe saw fit that that wasn't going to be it. And I moved and such. But Ryan, so 17 years of doing this work already, get there, you know, because to get the credential, you have to do the what? The practicum. So I was like a mental health consultant part time doing the practicum. The, the other time, like left my job as children's services manager in San Mateo because I was like, I'm going to open this school. Um, and one of the things that they had they did at the school that I had never experienced before that every single family that was enrolled got a sheet that said, here are all the children and families names, here are their email addresses, here's their physical address, here's their phone number. Don't talk about parties at school. You go home and you call them and you invite whoever you want to come to your party. I was like, oh my God, like they gave them their phone numbers, their emails and their addresses. What about somebody's parent kind of like loses it? To me, it was like, when, when they, like they gave all of that personal information away, but the children knew it. Um, so you would hear them whispering because I wouldn't stop them because I wanted to hear what they were saying. And they would start saying, well, you know, we're inviting Sybil and Theon to the party, but Carol and Beth can't come to my party. And Carol and Beth hear them. And I was like, they're creating like that. This is, turns into bully behavior when you get to kindergarten and first grade. That was my take on it. But the school's policy was you invite who you want to invite and you need to invite them. And my take on it was, we're creating a riff here because they're all talking about it at school because this is when they're with each other. So I felt like it wasn't well thought out, but you know, I was the powerless like <laughs> person who just needed to get this credential. So I was like, I'm going to shut up and mind my business until I get my credential. Then say, hey, y'all need to rethink that. But that's huge, Ron, around who gets invited to the party and who doesn't because it's about power and it's about demeaning other children that you are not worthy. And then what begins to happen is I saw this juggernaut started to happen. The other parents started having parties because their kids would say, Beth didn't invite me to her party. And Sean's at home having like a two hour cry fit. And his parents are like, oh my God. And then what you would see parents do with their frustration with their child and sense of hopefulness would turn into, we're gonna give Sean the best party they've ever seen. So then it turns into a competition with the adults. And I just saw it morph into this terrible, terrible thing around something that should say we're celebrating another year of you around the sun. And why can't we do that here where all the people who are your friends are? Like, to me, that was, we have people, it's like policy. The people who make the policies have never taught preschool. <laughs> they haven't. And then the people who are like making decisions around parties is like, have you never been four and had a birthday party? And then I begin to wonder, Ron, maybe they haven't. <laughs> like, maybe, maybe, maybe they haven't. So you're able to say, no parties at Head Start. And I'm like, they're four. You know that this is where their friends are. Like, they don't have friends when they leave here. So we've, we've got to reevaluate that around how we're pushing children down that path. And then we blame their parents to blame them. But we all have a hand to play in, in it um, that we haven't resolved yet. So when promoting friendship skills, some things to pay attention to on the left and then what we can do around influence. And this one talks about children with siblings. Um, I'm, I'm moving fast because there's a piece that I make sure I want to cover. More paying attention to and then what we can do around the follow through and then using things like second step 
um, to help and reduce because they're beneficial for children's um, friendship skills. And these things have lifelong effects on what children get at an early age. Um, and what we find is that the children who have close friendships in preschool tend to engage in fewer risky behaviors as they grow up and become pre-adolescent and teens. And they tend to have fewer mental health problems as adults because um, they followed them for over 40 years, um, children who had close friendships. And I always say, every time we see on the news those, those horrible things that happen where someone walks into the movie theater and just shoots people up, someone walks into the grocery store, they all have one thing in common. Every single time, even though we say, you know, most of those times those are white males, um, that's true also, but they also have one thing in common when they're not white, when they're Hispanic, Latin, Latinx, Black, you know, they all have one thing in common. They all end up saying they had no friends, which is that marker of how unhealthy thinking begins to take root when we don't have friendships. So that's what this research track, like children who had friendships that were healthy and positive, not bully friendships, not I don't know anything else to do, so I'm gonna join the gang, but healthy and positive friendships actually um, built them in, in a different way. And we have to pay attention to that. I'll share with you a quick story. I'm paying attention to the time, but so some, some slides I'm gonna skip here, but they're in the slide deck. My brother just reminded me the other day, it was so funny. He said, cause I remember um, there were some kids in our neighborhood and my mother was saying, you never go out and play with them. And like, she just kept saying it and kept saying it. And I didn't know how to say to her what I wanted to say to her. And one day she said it, and I guess my siblings were there too. And I said, mom, I don't want to be their friends because they're all standing under the tree smoking pot. Y'all just don't know it. They're 13 and 14 and 15 and they're all under the tree and they're all getting high. But my mother being who she was, like two days later, she went outside and like parked her car differently so she could walk past them. It's like she needed the confirmation. I'm like, why can't you just believe my words? Okay, I'll stop that and take that to therapy. Um, I'm resolve issues from being a teenager. And then she came in the house and was like, you're right. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She was like, they are smoking pot. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to leave you alone. But I forgot it. My brother reminded me of this just a few days ago that we had that whole exchange. Like I saw them as not being who I wanted to be with as a teenager. Um, and we've got to pay attention to that uh, as, as adults. We've got to pay attention to that. So a few of these slides here that are in your slide deck, I'm skipping, but they're explanatory. And I'm going in more detail here because these are the crux of some things that I'm, I'm making sure I want to cover. So there are three tiers around how we promote and teach children around friendship skills. So tier one are the things that we all do, this notion of friendship connections, things that bring children together. Um, they could be simple things as, you know, uh, Sean and Ron both like dancing, doing music and movement. Really, really simple things. Um, the teacher's modeling. These are the things that you all mentioned. Creating role plays around how children um, become friends in, the, in your preschool classroom, using books and puppets. These are things that all the children benefit from, and they should be a foundational piece of your uh, early childhood space. And then, you know, there's always this percolate up piece that, you know, you, you gave all that to us, but Sean and Beth need a little bit more. They are benefiting from that, but it seems like they're having some other things around friendship formations and they need a little bit more. We call these second tier um, strategies for teaching and support. So the first one is notion of cooperative activities. These are project-based tasks where we have children work together in small groups. We give them classroom jobs with a partner. So we say, Sean and Sybil, I need you both to clean off this table. Ron and Beth, you're gonna clean off that table. And that this notion of working together and contributing, Sean and I see Sean and Sybil smiling at each other. All the hallmarks of what? A budding friendship and working on small projects over time. So let's say your children in your classroom have been studying on the post office. So they take some boxes and they start making what? A post office car. They're cooperative activities that have been set up. Then there are these other things that are in our toddler and preschool classrooms that uh, lend themselves to promoting friendship skills. These are often things that children find hard to play with alone. Things like wagons, balls, and board games. Those are things that we typically don't play with by ourselves. We need a what? 
I need Beth to be my partner to do that with me. So those are those cooperative things that we have to think about to embed into the curriculum. Then there's friendship activities. Here's the piece here, don't fall out your seat. Friendship activities are adult direct, they're adult directed. You're not committing a sin if you have an adult directed experience every once in a while. I know, you know, in early childhood, it needs to be child-centered. It needs to be child-centered. And people fight online about this. And I'm like, can y'all go to DC and get people more money? I know too many early childhood educators who got four jobs. Um, friendship activities are non-competitive. And there are things like when we play songs, like um, put your left foot in, put your left foot out. They're non-competitive, but we do them together for games that emphasize what peer support really, really specific here. Um, and then those peer supported experiences. So to some of you may have heard of this is called stay play talk. So again, Beth has more what social skills than Sean. Sean needs some learning. So Beth becomes my peer buddy. Her skill isn't so far beyond mine. You've trained Beth. So you use a small group when you train children and tell your four or five target children, they're gonna be helping the other kids in the class. You're real, you're real clear around what it is because you're training them to be a peer support. This is the intervention that was studied, which is why it's called stay, play, talk. What happens is Beth noticed Sean because the teacher Ron has prepped Beth to say, when Sean's in the block area, I want you to play with him when he's there and this is what you're gonna do. Really simple. Beth noticed I'm, I'm there, she stays. She begins to play, Sean, what are you building? Then we begin to talk, oh, I don't know. I was just thinking I was putting them together and then Beth says, oh, it looks like a zoo. It's, it's, it's a rectangle. You're building a zoo? Then Sean says, yeah, I'm building a zoo. Remember, Beth had more capacity than me, but the whole purpose is what? The peer buddy support. So these are tier two strategies um, that work well. So Ron said, introduce the concept of creating a classroom community in these ways, definitely, definitely. They're, look at Beth, Star Day Play Talk. I love Beth. I got to take Beth with me. She's always pulling up that rear that um, I need. And then tier three strategies. These are the children, and some of you are like, wait a minute, some of those things look familiar to me. These are actually tier three strategies that if we use early and often, this is research-based. They have a tremendous, tremendous benefit. So we all know social stories, or sometimes called scripted stories, all right? One is copyrighted by Carol Gray and the other one isn't, which is why the social story thing is copyrighted and the scripted story thing isn't, because um, people like money and they like a lot of it. Um, we all know what that is. Many of you have been teaching pyramid train. Scripted stories are embedded in there. Um, that Tucker Turtle, Sonia Snell, those are scripted stories. Um, I thought I was going to give you all a version. Did I put it in the handouts? If not, I will make sure Leah has it because there was a scripted story around play that I wanted you all to um, have. So I didn't give it yet, but I'll make sure that Leah has it and she can give you the scripted story on um, play entry skills for a child who's new to the preschool classroom. That you, It's one sheet, but you can turn it into a book for your classroom. Then of course, visuals. Um, and those visuals demonstrate what children doing things together. So we're taking pictures, but we're using high quality photos so that children see the expected behavior um, mirrored back at them. And this other thing called a play script. So play scripts are really teaching children how to initiate play. So these are for children who don't have play entry skills. So here are the key components of a play script. It's about language and vocabulary and the actions to take. Play scripts are about how to teach children how to initiate play, how to teach children how to initiate play. Play scripts are about language and vocabulary. Play scripts are about actions to support. Here's what it looks like in two, two minutes. Two little boys in the playground, this is a true story in North Oakland. And one little boy stands at the top of the slide and he doesn't go down. The other little boy comes and knows he's standing there and he kind of just moves them out of the way and goes down and comes back. He's back there again. He moves him out of the way. He doesn't push him, but he moves him and he goes down again. The little boy who was standing there looking goes home and he says, Michael pushed me. Let's call him Noah. Noah's parents come and said, Noah's afraid of Michael because he pushed him. The teacher's like, what, what? And they're like, one teacher's like, I think I saw that. I think I saw that. And then it morphs into Michael pushed Noah and Michael is violent. 
right? Then they call the coach in. So, you know, Coach Sean shows up and he's like, well, can I watch Michael and Noah? And they're like, sure, they're both outside right now. And I go watch and guess what happens? The same thing happens. But I realize because I'm watching them, the intent and the impact that they both lack what? Play entry skills. That Noah doesn't, he's not paying attention to his surroundings. He doesn't see that I'm in the way and that Michael wants to go down the slide and then he's tried to go down three times. So he's just moving me out of the way. Michael doesn't have play entry skills also to say, Noah, I want to go down the slide. Could you step aside, please? See how that changes the game for both of them? That's our job to teach that. But it was literally turned into, I'm going to be honest with you all, one of the kids was white and one was black. You know what it turned into for the parents? A racial situation that was not a racial situation. You had two children who simply lacked play entry skills that their parents and their teachers needed to teach them. Play scripts provide that. Play scripts provide that. And this notion of priming, Beth was talking about this earlier. So priming is when we front load for children, is when we tell a child what will happen in a social activity. Is when we tell a child, you know, uh, Sean, how can you ask Alexis for a turn? We're outside and I want to get on the tricycle. So Sean, what can you say? You can say, Alexis, I would like a turn on the tricycle. And I follow Sean there and say, Sean, what can you say to Alexis? You want to what? You want to turn on the tricycle, say it louder to him, say the whole sentence. That's priming and front loading for play entry skills. All right. Really, really great, great strategies at the tier three level. So if you take nothing else from today, understand the difference between tier one strategies, which many of us are very familiar with, what tier two strategies are. And these are the strategies that I find most preschool teachers aren't very familiar with around the difference in the intent and when we need to bring them up. And then tier three, tier three strategies, the social stories and the visuals most of us are very familiar with and not the play scripts and the priming. And there are two others that I don't have on the screen here. Um, oh, I'm making really good time, Beth. We call it monitoring center time. And that means, um, I would say, I see you shared some blocks with Kelvin when you were in the block area, Beth. I'm monitoring and I'm what? calling the spotlight to it, because that's going to help what? Beth's like, oh, Mr. Ron saw me help, you know, share my blocks. I want to do that again, because I want him to tell me more of what, of what I did well, opposed to what I didn't do. And the other one is what we call embedded friendship opportunities. This is typically for children who have IEPs. It's usually a specialist that'll come in and help you create it. But I didn't want to get into it because it becomes really detailed. But in, in essence, you all can do it yourself. Is when we create a matrix, right? So the matrix may be to help Skylar from arrival until nap time. So the matrix says, Skylar, what we teach Skylar every day is at arrival, when Skylar comes in, Skylar's going to put her coat away and she's going to say hello to the children who she can see and use their name. Really concrete. So that Skylar walks in and she says, Hi, Beth. And then Beth looks and she says, Hey. Then Scholar says, good morning, Sean. And I say, hey, Scholar, because we played together yesterday. And then one more child, because she can see Sean, Beth, and Ron. And she says, oh, Ron, you're playing with the blocks. Good morning, Ron. That we, we're teaching her that and what? Prepping her and priming her to come in at arrival, to notice children, say hello, and use their names. Then the matrix will say, at the tables, you know, you may have um, a child who enjoys horses. So you're going to put out farm animals. Um, then what you do is Skyler loves horses, Llewellyn loves farm animals, you make sure that they sit beside each other because Llewellyn has much more skills around language and social skills than Skylar, and you want them to talk to each other when they play. So that matrix goes down your day for when you're going to embed those friendship opportunities for young children. Um, not difficult, they're all over the internet, but I know oftentimes in early childhood, it looks good on paper, but those are the things we often resist, which is why I was like, I'm not going to take the time to put that matrix up there because there are a ton online. But literally, that's how we embed the friendship opportunities throughout um, the day for children who really, really need that, that level of support. Is it this question here? Oh, great. Beth said, great idea. We should do one of the play scripts in primary. I was thinking that Beth around the ones that are deeper and require more, teasing them out. Mm -hmm. Carol Jensen says, I love the play scripts and priming idea. We use a lot of model appropriate behavior. 
Um, is there a training around priming? It's a, it's, you know what? So it, it could have been uh, in, the, in the C cephal teaching pyramid, because many of these things are there, but because it requires that kind of more expansive teaching piece, it's usually the um, special ed specialists or inclusion specialists who, who create those things and do those things and not what we call the general ed teacher, that would be us, but um, it's not very, very difficult. It just requires more planning, more thoughtfulness, more assessing the child, using your observations to find out where they are, what their needs are, writing the plan down, seeing that it makes sense, checking with your partner, and then following through every single day that you're helping the child, not as a burden, but to what? Embed friendship opportunities throughout the day because you want that child to be successful at what? Making friends and becoming friendly and um, being noticed. So that's essentially that parent that came and said, Mr. Ricky, I want, I want little Sean to have some friends. He, don't have, he has no friends. Mr. Ricky can do what? Create a matrix for the day and say, here are the five things we're gonna do every day during these five periods. It doesn't have to be from arrival to departure. It could just be some key periods of time when you can really support Sean and building friendships um, that are needed, not just because his mother wants people to come to his birthday party, um, because she didn't say, Sean was saying, nobody's coming to my party, nobody's coming to my party, and that it broke his mother's heart. Because that's usually what parents are advocating for without telling you, I cried all night because of what my four-year-old said to me. Most of them won't show up in school and tell us that. We hear the other side of it, which is a little bit of the frustration. So in closing, Beth, Ooh, we did it. I want you all to think about this, and then we're going to use this as our closing in the chat. To teach friendships, I will. Think about it. To teach friendships, I will. To teach friendships, I will. So what I want you to do, I want us to, um, some people like this one. It's not a big one of mine, but um, I like to give people what they want. Uh, I want you to think about it. We're gonna type them in the chat, but don't hit enter or return with several on your key. Don't hit enter or return, type it in the chat. And then I'm gonna to count to three and then we're all gonna hit return at the same time and flood the chat with um, around 40 responses to this question. I teach to teach friendships I will think about it and then type your answer in the chat. Don't hit send or return. And then I'm going to count and tell everybody to hit that. All right. So for those who aren't on camera, I'm using the people on camera as my litmus test. So I'm looking at them and it looks like most of them have stopped, type, have stopped typing. So um, I'm going to count to three. And on three, we're all going to hit return. Um, and if you still type in, it's okay, keep typing and then hit return when you stop. All right, one, two, three. Wow, that was fun. <laughs> All right, they're still coming in. Awesome. They're so great. In. They're still coming in. Uh, so we have here. Uh, where is it? Okay, so Ron says, introduce all these concepts of teachers and trainings and families and family letters and newsletters. Uh, Stephanie said, do my part as a parent. Sybil says, to teach play entry skills. Mm -hmm. Ricky says, play close attention to what's going on with children and make sure they all have, are involved in friendship. That's awesome. Leon says, more open to cultural diversity and parents' influence on children making friends. Ooh, that's huge, Leon. Um, Alan Truck says, model and find and create opportunities in positive ways. Carol Jen says, to teach friendships, I will show and model my behavior. I will respect inclusive and be kind to others. Namaya says, show children how to welcome each other. Oh, nice. Okay. And then it says, observe the child more, tell activities to help them assist the child in making friends. That's big. Um, we'll also find out from family more information on the interests of the child. That is huge. Like that is, that's something that I think would be the basis of everything we do. Simone said, model kindness through smiles and hellos. 
it goes a long way. Um, Sophie says, read books about building friendships and use peer child leaders to help build friendships. Masuma says, help each other, play with others and talk with each other, definitely. Medea says, I will encourage families to help us to build children's friendship strategies. Nothing like a parent partner. Uh, this is Cassie says, support children in positive environments and model friendship skills also implement the tears. Okay, Cassie, she's gonna use that as my basis. Start at the tier one and then move up when you need to. Um, sometimes what we find, Cassie, is if we're doing tier one really well, we won't need to move up. Um, or you may have one or two children, not six or eight. Peer supported activities, modeling support, positive modeling, knowing the family in the background, that's really important, May. Partner up the kids, playing in small groups. Iris, that is awesome. Pick one friend to play with you each day. I actually have some videos around that, Iris, but I was really trying not to show videos in this one. I wanted you all to have more time in the small groups and to talk to each other, which is why I intentionally didn't show um, those clips. Uh, Sanying said, observe and know the individual child in a deep way to know which strategies are the most effective to use. Yes, can we put a star beside that one, Bethalia? Maria says, I will observe and become a play partner first and then guide the child. That is awesome, Maria. I wish more people wanted to become a play partner. Um, we need to be able to facilitate play. It is the missing, missing element. Um, I'll just say this, Beth, and then we'll end. So Beth knows that, and she read it in the bio, that there's a new book coming out. Many of you have read Julie Nicholson and Julie Kurtz books. So there are already four um, trauma books. One is on ECE, one is on leadership, one is on culture. So the next one that's coming out is family engagement. And I actually was a contributing author on that book, the one around family engagement, just lots of my stories over the years with families and trauma and being responsive. The next book that I'm not sure I'm, I may or may not be a part of, but it's on play. It's a practical book on play. And for me, I was asked to participate because they know like this notion of facilitating play, which is what um, she's talking about there um, around how to be a play partner and how to help children facilitate it. We've moved away from it and we need to come back to it to help children to be successful. And Maria says to give them space to observe and do activities and what the child likes. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Beth. Yes, thank you everybody for attending. We're so happy you were here. Um, I hope we'll see you again at a future training. Thank you, Sean, again, as usual. Hit it out of the ballpark. I think uh, everybody, I think, has learned a lot. Please remember to complete your evaluation. That helps so much to know what other kinds of trainings you're interested in. So um, for today, we'll thank you this Friday Eve and um, hope you have a nice weekend. And I'll really look forward to seeing you again at our next training.